So the full translations are out and I'm glad there's no break next week because this chapter's cliffhanger was very interesting. Assuming you've already read the chapter, I think there's four main theories around the community for how that ending could have turned out. I'll elaborate on them later along with explaining which theory I believe in the most. However, this is a heavy text-based chapter and considering I've pride myself to go in depth for those who get confused reading JJK, get your thinking caps on because we're gonna need to focus up. So picking up from last week, we saw Gojo expand his domain to allegedly cover Malevolent Shrine's entire radius, so roughly up to 200 meters, and then he reduced it, which leaves us to this chapter, as Meimei says that his small domain, in theory, should strengthen Infinite Void's barrier, since the space is more concentrated and very dense. Now, Maki gives us a reminder that a domain's expansion on the outside does not translate to the same length of space on the inside. So just like how Dagon's domain was a literal beach, the outside of his barrier wasn't that big. It most likely was just the typical size of a regular domain shell. Meaning, in Gojo and Sukuna's perspective right now, they're not actually compressed or miniatured. However, Kusakabe replies that there still exist limits. Limits as in, while Maki is correct in that the domain space on the inside and outside differs, there still needs a concrete image manifest. To visualize what Kusakabe is trying to say with stick figures, let's say person A and person B are in a battle. Person A expands his domain expansion and the radius of the shell is 200 meters. The inside of that domain is a normal sized beach, like Dagon's. When person A reduces his domain down to 100 meters, the inside doesn't change, it's still the regular sized beach. When he shrinks it down to 50 meters, it's the same thing. However, and this is what Kusakabe was implying, shrinking it down to an inch would be impossible because at that point, the volume size would be so small that it wouldn't be able to even hold person A itself. So this can can't manifest that concrete image, aka the beach, that barrier techniques have because there's a certain threshold or a certain limit to how small you can actually reduce it before the entire domain shatters. Although the reason how Gojo is able to maintain that intense level of density right now without breaking his domain is because of his experience from the prison realm. And this is really interesting because obviously on the outside, the prison realm is the size of a small cube. So does that exterior space translate to the volume on the inside, as in your body is forced to being squished when trapped in the prison realm, or does the space work like domain expansions? Because Chozo is implying that it isn't, right? He's saying that Gojo is able to maintain a barrier technique that's less than his own volume right now because that's how the prison realm treated Gojo. Unless this is more of a mental experience then. Nonetheless, Kusakabe is still surprised that Gojo can change the domain's conditions every activation because majority majority of regular domains were already built with pre-established conditions. For example, the first time Jogo likely manifested his domain, the rules and conditions were already made for him. Conditions like how big the domain is, how fast the activation speed is going to be, the level of potency on the sure hits, etc. That's why it's presumably difficult to change the conditions on every activation because at that point, you would be rewriting the fundamentals of your created barrier. Though, Hikari and Higuruma are considered exceptions, they can easily change their domain's conditions because their domains are purely based on their curse techniques. Meaning, unlike everybody else where they would have to rewrite the foundations of their created barrier, Hikari and Higuruma's domain already come in a package with their curse technique. So changing the conditions like Hikari shifting the domain's coordinates, something like that should just be natural to him as they don't have to rewrite or reprogram the fundamentals like other people do. And I hope this at least foreshadows seeing Hikari and or Higuruma's domain one more time before the story ends because after learning this information, I feel like Hikari's domain can be considered one of the best to even clash against an open barrier domain. But back to the chapter, Gojo's dense infinite void seems to be working well as Mamie says it's holding out, although it does eventually break as according to Yuta's presumption, Sakuna also decreases his domain's range just like Gojo and this time allowed the cleave and dismantles to damage infinite void from the outside. Now, it's kind of odd that Sukuna attempted to damage the outside barrier instead of attempting to damage Gojo on the inside using his ambiguous curse technique. In fact, even Gojo points this out near the end of the chapter, but we'll get there soon because it ties along with the cliffhanger discussion. But before we move on, let me tell you guys about the new limited pre-orders from Swipe Mousepad. By teaming up with a talented artist named Paji, the brand was able to bring these epic Naruto and Jujutsu Kaisen designs to life. I know we got a lot of Gojo fans during the 
these weekly chapters. So this is a perfect time to buy his mouse pad, or you can get all four pads as a bundle sale where you're really only paying for the price of three. In fact, if you purchase any of the designs and use my code with proof via tagging me, you'll be entered in a giveaway where I'll buy another mouse pad for you. So you can get one for yourself and one to a friend for free. Even if you don't win the giveaway, you still get an awesome product for the buck, but these pre-orders only last till next Friday, the 14th of July. So get them while you can by clicking the link in the description and use my code FAKEWEEB to get 15% off your order. Once again, that's FAKEWEEB for 15% off. Thanks, guys. So when Infinite Void gets sliced up by Sakuna's sure hits, Malevolent Shrine also gets destroyed due to Gojo damaging Sakuna to the point where he couldn't maintain his domain. Now, with the way that's worded, it's implied that Gojo physically damaged Sakuna inside the domain clash just enough to break Malevolent Shrine at the exact same time Malevolent Shrine's sure hits destroyed Gojo's domain. We know it happened at the same time because Hikari shouts, it was simultaneous, and we also see Sakuna's bloody chest when Infinite Void breaks, so they basically tied each other and are now in a scenario where they're supposed to be facing Cursed Technique Burnout. However, Maki reminds us that both Gojo and Sukuna can use Reverse Cursed Technique to heal their Burnt Out Cursed Technique, and then Yuta kind of interjects Maki saying, in theory, I should be able to do that too, but as I said earlier, I can't use Reverse Cursed Technique to heal a Burnt Out Cursed Technique. I'll come back to Yuta's point later because this also ties into the cliffhanger discussion but Angel replied saying that Gojo made the mistake by showing that maneuver to Sakuna. Considering Sakuna was able to turn himself into a cursed object after experiencing it the first time with the help of Kinjaku, then just like Gojo, who was stated in the volume 1 extra that he can do anything he tries, example the simple domain a couple chapters ago, Sakuna's in that same boat. So they both use reverse curse technique to heal their burnt out curse technique, and after scrapping close quarters, Gojo starts wondering, in the domain clash they just recently had why Sukuna hasn't used Maharaga or used his mysterious techniques in general when inside the domain. Instead, Sukuna was using domain amplification to counter his infinity, but at least from what Gojo implies, had he summoned Maharaga there, the adaptability power could have been an effective tool to counter Gojo's limitless. But Gojo also thinks that maybe Sukuna was hesitant to summon it, considering a potent enough attack like purple or red would have one-shotted Maharaga. Although, after, it shows a panel of the wheel turning, an indication that it has adapted to an attack, and Gojo's nose suddenly starts bleeding. The chapter ends with the editor's note saying, what do those eyes see through? Okay, so now to go over the community's four possibilities. First one up, I don't think this could be poison. Yes, Sukuna is known as the king of all lethal poisons, but we've seen advanced levels of RCT heal poison before in the story. Unless Sukuna is an exception because he is the king of all poisons. I still think by the way this cliffhanger flowed, going panel to panel, there's no visual sign that this is something else other than being related to the wheel. Of course, while it's possible for this moment to be a red herring, I think that in itself makes it less believable compared to the other three theories. Up next is Gojo, just getting exhausted or overexerting himself as hinted by Yuta and Ino in the past couple of chapters. I find this possibility more likely than the poison theory, because while Gojo can't run out of of cursed energy due to his six signs and reverse curse technique, Ino implies that it's only under normal circumstances, whereas domain expansions are a different story because we have seen Gojo get exhausted before when he activated the 0.2 second domain in Shibuya. So doing it three times in this fight while changing the conditions multiple times could be the reason why he's getting a nosebleed. But again, similar to the poison theory, it would have to be a red herring since the cliffhanger ended by showing Maharaga's wheel and then Gojo Gojo getting a nosebleed right after. Unless we're saying this is a mix of Maharaga's wheel and Gojo getting exhausted at the exact same time. More specifically, maybe Gojo strained his six eyes by looking through the shadows and then seeing the wheel in the depths. Possible, but nonetheless, the next theory is the wheel always having been active from the start. This one makes the most sense to me, but it also has some flaws that would disregard the theory. First, to point out the obvious, we get a panel of Maharaga's wheel turning, and that's when Gojo suddenly starts feeling dizzy. This was also right before Gojo was wondering why Sukuna hadn't summoned the wheel inside the domain clash. So based on the sequence of panels, the story is making us believe that Maharaga is the cause of Gojo's nosebleed, but never in this fight does Sukuna perform the hand sign to pre-summon the wheel like he did with Yorozu. So the question is, did Sukuna
Kuna summoned the wheel before the fight started, as the wheel has always been active, but this time within the shadows. We have seen Megami store things in his shadows before, and yeah, the panel of the wheel is surrounded by darkness. There is a problem in that Sukuna had used domain amplification during the recent domain clash, meaning the wheel couldn't have been active since domain amp cancels the usage of your innate technique. Unless we say that Sukuna summoned it after the domain collapsed, but I feel like at that point, the crew would have caught Sukuna doing some sort of hand sign. There could be an argument made where maybe the 10 shadows doesn't count as an innate technique for Sukuna's amplification, because remember, in the second domain clash, the sure hits of Cleave and Dismantle were still active while Sukuna was using domain amplification, and that's because the statement of amplification doesn't include the curse techniques from a domain. They are considered another story, being different from an innate technique. So what if that innate technique statement is very strict with its definition, whereas it's also different from Sukuna's Ten Shadows because his actual innate technique is not the Ten Shadows, but the Shrine and or Cleave and Dismantles instead. Definitely a possibility, but Bruh. also sounds like a stretch, since if the Ten Shadows isn't regarded as a rule for amplification, then why not summon Maharaga or any of the Shikigami inside the domain? Maybe Sukuna is purposely waiting for Gojo to use all his powers so that the wheel can adapt to everything in Gojo's arsenal, but based on the fight in Shibuya, Maharaga adapts to attacks individually, meaning if it was always summoned before, we should have gotten a panel of the wheel turning earlier in the battle. So honestly, this could be something new that we just haven't seen before in the story. I've heard some people say that maybe Sukuna fused Maharaga in him, just like how two Shikigami can be fused together. I mean, the first time Sukuna pre-summoned the wheel, he did say it was for a test drive, so it shouldn't be surprising if the next chapter explains that the wheel was summoned or active through another unseen way, because according to the editor's note at least, the six eyes did see something. Again, unless it's all a red herring and it's actually related to Yuta's statement about Gojo over exerting himself, I'd be kind of surprised if it turned out that way, but yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below, and with all that being said, I'll catch you guys in the next chapter. Peace.